Oh, a popular tourist route along the North Kaikoura coast is now a dead-end road. After Monday's quake, State Highway 1 remains shut off to all but emergency vehicles, isolating small rural communities. 12.02 on the 14th, uh, we uh, all got woken up out of bed and had trouble dressing, uh, pushed into the walls, couldn't stand up. I felt it. Um, it was the middle of the night. Uh, I was in Christchurch at the time. Uh, the most vivid memory is trying to wake my son up. It took a few seconds to sort of work out what was going on, no power. And then we all hightailed it to a, a high point in town where we, after a few hours, we uh, met up. And we knew at that point that this was going to have some serious implications for people. We organised a helicopter with a local chopper pilot, Daniel Stevenson, and him and myself went for a flight at uh, 5.30 on the 14th a.m. And we probably took half an hour flying north and south. It looked like a dinosaur had walked through the, the corridor and just smashed its tail everywhere. But in some sections it was untouched, and in some sections the road was thrown into the sea. And I just remember thinking, you know, I'd never seen anything like it. I mean, the devastation was huge. It must have been so frightening for the locals and the communities down there. And so I was speechless. Uh, yeah, it was just amazing. You know, when the first time you see those slips, you know, the first thing that goes through your mind is how long is this going to take? You know, you've got communities there that are cut off. You've got the New Zealand freight industry who has to travel, you know, hours longer to get their freight uh, up and down the South Island. So the first thing that goes to your mind is how fast can we mobilise? How fast can we get this work done? It was quite humbling looking up at the slips when I first got there in May 17. Just seeing this destruction, it's one thing to see it on the news, but when you're standing at the foot of a mountain that's basically collapsed into the sea across the road and rail, um, it makes you realise how insignificant we really are as humans. The, the, the concrete plant initially was set up in late April and started, well, it took about two weeks to set up. I didn't know what that plant run like. Like, I know how the Greymouth plant runs because I run it all the time. Mm -hmm. I know exactly what I can put out and how fast I can do it. Mm -hmm. I had to learn that whole plant. I had to learn all the noises and clanks and bangs. matter of time our concrete pools with the tide. Sometimes the water was actually coming back in as we were still pouring. So to make sure I knew what why, when they rung up say I want 80 cube, okay we can do this. We got it the tide comes in at this time I said I'll be able to get you 60 cube by the time the tide comes in and then that'll be it. Each of these blocks was two metres by one metre by one metre, so five tonne. And I think in the end we placed 1,400 of those. 
Some were brought in on the rail yep. later on, but yep. most of them were actually trucked in. Initially, uh, we were down there to set up the concrete plant, uh, and then one day I was talking to our Bob officer about pug mills, if um, we would find a pug mill, and Bob mentioned Fort Hogan, uh, but no one really knew at the time if the pug mill would work for the No Fines Agra, it was more built for the, uh, um, the low cement dosage. So uh, moved from there and we did a trial in Christchurch with Fort Nugget's brand new pug mill, which had never been used. Um, and we put some ag uh, local aggregates in from Christchurch, uh, mm -hmm. but the same consistency that we're going to be using up on uh, Kaikoura. Yep. Uh, and did a, um, did a test on that and it worked good as gold. And a week later, we, we moved the pug mill up there. Um, one person to pump over the cement and keep it check of what it's actually we're, we're producing and quality control and another person drive the loader on one to operate the pug mill. Yeah. So with the three of us working together for months, and it was the three of us all the time, we actually rotated around each other's jobs. Nothing about pug mills at all. Yeah. I, before I went there I looked on the internet to find out what the hell a pug mill was. It was a big learning curve, but it was good. It was a, a really good challenge. You're right, everything happened quickly. Once we set up the first uh, plant there, which we, that's all we thought we were going to be doing, and then when the pug mills happened, well, as soon as a decision on another pug mill happened, you had to have it up and running within about a week, week and a half. Yeah. So you had to organise your, your trucking people, your drainage people. It was, it was quite different because, one, it's the first time we've ever run the pug mill uh, in that situation. Pretty much a new business for us. Mm -hmm. um, and it really it was down to the team just managing to mobilise quickly and actually just sort of, we had to sort of make it up as we go. Mm -hmm. So we were testing and then coming up with solutions just to make it work. So, if, you know, if the Allied Holson and Fulton Hogan team hadn't worked well together, we would have probably all struggled. The no fines is a real, that was our biggest change. So the stabilised aggregates we sort of had done a little play yes. with, but the no fines was just knowing what it should look like. You know, there was real efficiencies to be made around balancing the size and the, and the truss percentage and actually what byproducts were coming out of that. So there was a lot of tweaking done in that first month or two, especially when we went to 24 hours. You know, if we hadn't got that right, that recipe right, we wouldn't have kept up. A normal crushing site that's nowhere near. We, we, we normally go there, crush, and then we go away, and then people come in and load the product out. Yeah. So all of this all happened at once. So not only are we making product, we're mixing product, we're loading out trucks. You know, we're pretty much a full one-stop shop. So we're flying over, and there was trucks back right up to the road. So you know, 30, 40 truck and trailers deep, mm. and, and yet we, so we had concrete trucks going out. We had. Um, trucks loading out from the pug mill, we had uh, slip trucks, you know, so Nick were bringing in all the slip material, which is thousands of tonnes a day. That was all happening in one area, you know. <laughs> the pug broke out, everything stopped, so there was a real sort of upskill from our side to actually make sure we had parts sitting right there ready to go so we're only ever down for an hour or two. It was, it was basically keeping ahead of it. So um, I was basically at a high level pretty much almost forest, uh, fighting fires, you know, trying to think of what problems are going to come up, you know, that were really pushing, we were really pushing, we were pushing everything, we were pushing people, we were pushing plant. Um, so we had to really balance getting our supply of eggs, plant running and people and, and that was yeah that was sort of a 24 hour day. The being away from home that challenged a lot of people I think. The doing new tasks that challenged a lot of people as well. But I think just trying to get it done in that environment. getting everybody working on the same page. And we quite often, and we, we had to end up by being quite flexible because 
we'd turn up at night time knowing that we're doing 500 metres to say slide six. And I'd turn around and say, no, 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 it's only going to be half that amount there and you're going to send half the amount to a site two maybe. Just a day shift to running 24 hours. Yeah, yeah that's right. So that was another challenge again. So you had to go get guys that were used to doing night shifts. Our surfacing guys helped out. So the guys that were used to working night shifts who can drive loaders and all that stuff, they we had a couple of them jump in. Everybody thought the timeline was a little bit unrealistic, yep. even, even us, yep. when we were there because because um, the amount of material that we had to push out the door through, whether it be concrete or the pugma, whichever it had to be. Yep. But um, I think it was a good thing because even though it was very tough, it was quite realistic to achieve it. It just had to be thought of properly to do it. Malaitan and Fault Nogan, everyone a week or two, everyone was helping each other and looking after each other. And that was probably the key to that whole project. Yeah. There was a lot of guys there from, like I say, a, different, a lot of different companies, but they all brought different sorts of skill sets to the equation. Yeah. So when you join those people together, you ended up with some really good functional teams. One of the greatest things is being involved in a project like that. Um, me and myself, I've only been involved in one summer, and that was uh, the Northern Gate in Auckland. And that was just something they had to build, not something they had to rebuild. Today, South Island motorists were able to drive the route between Kaikoura and Picton for the first time in over a year. The road has finally reopened, pretty much exactly on schedule. Logan Church was there when the sign changed from road closed to road open. Yeah.